Hi, and welcome to National 5 Urban Geography. In this lesson, I'm going to take you through the key points for the recent developments in the CBD, inner city and rural urban fringe. We're going to use Edinburgh as our developed world case study. And I'll take you through the recent developments in the favelas. We'll use Rio de Janeiro, Brazil as our case study. So let's get started with Rio de Janeiro. Sometimes called shanty towns, the favelas are slum housing. And you can see that the picture here gives you an idea of what some of South America's favelas, as they refer to, look like. Let's look at the question. Referring to a developing world city you've studied, describe different ways shanty towns are being improved. The key things to get right here are to make sure you are referring to a developing city that you've studied. Simply saying Rio de Janeiro doesn't really do this. You, you have to show that you've studied it. So we need examples and we need um, those examples to be real ones. Okay, so here are some ways that the shanty towns uh, favelas of Rio de Janeiro have been improved. Some of the buildings have been restored and upgraded into these kind of more permanent looking uh, settlements. Sometimes these have electricity and running water, sometimes not. Um, and as you can see underneath the picture, there's a sentence which you could note down and that would earn you one mark. Communities come together to paint their neighbourhoods. This is um, these pictures are quite famous and they're an attempt to bring neighbourhood community spirit together but also to make the favela a more pleasant environment to live in and to also increase its tourist appeal. These are all reasons why uh, this change has taken place in the favelas. In this picture you can see one of the local residents who will not necessarily have any formal training or skills um, using um, materials that have been provided by the government in the form of bricks and mortar to um, reinforce or rebuild or improve his home. These are self-help schemes as you can see and local people um, basically upgrade their homes. Clean running water is a constant problem in favelas and it is um, really important that uh, we improve it. So but having basic facilities like toilets and electricity installed is always going to improve life. Um, other little changes that are made is for example residents can be given legal rights to their land. That means basically that they are given formal ownership to the building that they are in. And this means that they can't be evicted. It also means that they can be taxed and that can pay for all sorts of services such as installing toilets and electricity. Remember to pause the video as I go through to note down these um, key mark winning points. Charities become involved in favelas. A good example of this is um, the charity Water Aid, who build um, clean water pumps and so on. But uh, UNICEF are a charity who donate money to help improving uh, accommodation and um, schooling. In school situations, um, they provide computers, textbooks, and even um, fund training of teachers. Security is a constant problem in the favelas. They're famous for their um, high um, crime rate, specifically related to the drugs industry. Um, the Brazilian government in Rio de Janeiro has taken an aggressive approach with this and they've introduced something called the pacification squads. Uh, these are specially trained police units that operate within the favelas. Uh, they're trained to deal with uh, drugs crime specifically and they're aim is to pacify, that means bring peace, to the more dangerous neighbourhoods within the favelas. As you can see, they're very uh, heavily equipped uh, police officers um, and they have helped to reduce drugs-related crime. There are negatives associated with their presence as well. 
Um, but simply knowing about them and being able to summarise their job and the fact that they've reduced drugs related crime will be enough for you for the moment. Rio famously was one of the first favelas to build a cable car system. The favelas, as you can see in the photos, are often built up on hillsides. And for disabled or elderly people, it's very difficult to escape the favela. Um, it's very difficult for them to get out of the favela and go into the city centre of Rio de Janeiro. Um, the cable cars were uh, an attempt to solve this problem. Sometimes the government has stepped in and knocked down an area of the favela and built uh, prefabricated houses. Prefabricated means uh, pre-manufactured. So as you can see, this building is made out of a simple grid of concrete floors. And then they've built very simple living units within the concrete grid. Um, this is cheap, simple and effective housing. The name Rocinha you see here is the name of a very famous favela within Rio de Janeiro. Charities become involved again when they build schools, as I've mentioned, but also health clinics can be provided for the residents to, uh, to get free or very low cost health care. And possibly one of my favourite ones, um, the roads have been improved. And this is really important because some have been widened, some have been given tarmac surfaces, and that allows important services like this rather cute looking rubbish truck to access the favelas. And that of course means the streets are cleaner, disease doesn't spread so easily, um, and infestations of things like rats are more easily controlled. So just to, to pause there for a second, what you should do is re-watch this part of the lesson, pause on each picture, note down the marks that are scored, and remember, when you try to put this together into a model answer at the end of taking those notes, you should start your answer off, in Rio de Janeiro, the following developments have taken place. And then you can go through these notes and produce the answer. Okay. You need to know about recent developments in developed countries as well. Our developed example is Edinburgh in Scotland. And um, the question asks to refer to a developed world city that you've studied. That means give detail. Give reasons for the recent changes which have taken place in the CBD. One of the first changes that we've seen in recent years is that our high streets have started to become um, very run down, scruffy, with lots of closed up shops. Just wait for that bell to pass there, sorry about that. Um, this is because of online shopping causing too much competition and uh, because they can sell goods that are cheaper the, on, the, the high street shops just closed down. Again, pause the video and note down where the marks are scored. Um, this can lead to lots of vacant shop spaces and empty uh, units. But one of the, uh, the good things about this is that that can lead to pop-up businesses. Pop-up businesses are, are, are businesses that appear for a short period of time. Um, an example of this in Edinburgh would be the Christmas markets which have uh, taken advantage of um, changes in the rules of where businesses can set up to, to make a, a really good profit at certain times of year. So the next change that we see in the CBD is things like pedestrian zones. This picture you can see here is of Maltrees Walk. And this makes the area more appealing and safer to customers and generally makes people want to come back into the CBD. Some high order shops have been invited back into the CBD. Harvey Nichols is an excellent example. The Council of Edinburgh actually gave them um, lower rates of business tax in order to encourage them to come into Edinburgh city centre. And this really increases the appeal of the area to visitors. 
The council is also trying to tackle traffic. Uh, this headline that I've grabbed off the BBC website gives a really good up-to-date example of the council's idea to have traffic-free days beginning in Edinburgh city centre. This is going to reduce pollution, it's going to make the city quieter and safer and once again more attractive for people to visit. This idea of the city centre being more attractive to visitors is a reoccurring theme in this answer and really all of the changes that have taken place in the CBD are geared towards making the CBD an attractive, um, desirable place for businesses to set up and people to visit. Transport's been made uh, easier to use and more uh, comfortable. A good example is the Edinburgh Tram system, which connects tourists straight to the airport. This makes it quicker and easier for tourists to get into the centre. Um, examples of pavements that have been widened simply to increase the amount of space for the word here, footfall, just means shopping pedestrians. It's a useful word to know. And uh, what we've done here is we've widened the pavements on either side and even pedestrianised the area in between in order to encourage and increase the number of people coming shopping. Moving on to recent developments in the inner city. In fact, I'll go back one step there. Just looking at the CBD again here, everyone. Um, in all of these pictures... Um, you need to reinforce one constant message and that is that the CBD um, has problems like shut down shops and so on, scruffy high streets, but that all of the solutions are geared towards encouraging people to come back into the CBD. Not just tourists but also uh, workers and visitors and shoppers and also the businesses themselves. Okay, so moving on to recent developments in the inner city. Your typical exam questions on the screen, it says, referring to a developed world city you've studied, that's Edinburgh, give reasons for the recent changes which have taken place. You will need a case study, and our case study this time is an area of Edinburgh called Gorgie, that's G-O-R-G-I-E. You can see that the inner city in the diagram has a series of problems, a few services, low quality housing, a lot of derelict areas, areas of wasteland, and high levels of unemployment. We need to account for how this situation has developed and changed over recent years. First of all, uh, the derelict housing is known as tenement housing. And in Gorgie, there's a lot of tenement housing laid out in gridiron streets. And many of them were built to a very uh, low standard in the first instance, or had been allowed to fall into a poor state of repair. In order to make them more valuable, more desirable, and to raise their property value, um, they've been renovated. This word here, renovate. You'll sometimes hear your ta teacher talk about uh, regeneration, and that's the same thing. To regenerate these buildings is to improve them with new windows, bathrooms, buzzer entry systems on doors, uh, double glazing, anything that makes life more comfortable. Some of the old tenements, however, were destroyed and replaced. And these tower blocks were the uh, buildings that replaced them. Uh, this is out at Site Hill in Edinburgh, another case study example you need to try to remember. Those buildings have since, I'm afraid, um, not been a good solution and have themselves been destroyed. So tower blocks have been pulled down and they've been replaced by brand new housing to improve the living conditions in these regenerated areas. So the very old housing has been regenerated and renovated to make it more attractive, but the modern replacements that were built in the 60s and the 1970s and 1980s, those unfortunately were not a suitable solution. Um, and so those have since been destroyed and um, replaced again. Improvements have been made in other areas too, like for example in this picture you can see a canal towpath, this is the Union Canal, and the towpath has been cleaned and restored, it's had lights put on it, and it's had a cycle path added. This makes this once quite dangerous area actually uh, much more attractive, and it means that people use it for family walks or to cycle to work, it's become a really popular 
uh, route way through the city. A gap site is an area that's been left behind just almost as if by accident in between all the old factories that used to exist in the inner city. Um, these gap sites can often be used by um, enterprising business and a good example of that is the Gorgie City Farm uh, which is a, I would thoroughly recommend as a day out if you've not been. Um, it, it's a functioning farm within the city and it operates in a tiny little plot of land that's been left over um, as the years of industrial land use have kind of changed uh, and developed in Gorgie. So uh, gap sites get used by uh, innovative industry. It's a, it's a good mark to try and score. This satellite photo, a picture shows you that um, some plots of land, like this triangular plot of land here you see in the, in the northwest, um, have been used um, by new industries. Small industrial units replaced old heavy industries. Uh, an example of this is McFarlane Smith, who famously are Scotland's main medicinal drug factory. And, and they, they're built just behind Tynecastle Stadium. You can see Tynecastle, the heart's ground, just here. Um, this is in Gorgie. And just to the west, to the northwest, is the McFarlane Smith Medicinal Drugs Factory. It's a good example of a new industrial unit replacing old heavy industries. Um, Gorgie itself is a gridiron street pattern and the roads were never designed for the volume of traffic that they receive, as you can see in the picture. Um, so there have been some improvements. Nearby there's the Murrayfield tram station. That means that uh, visitors going out to Murrayfield Rugby Stadium um, have a quicker, easier route to get there and it improves transport access to and from the inner city. Simpler marks can be scored just by saying that there's a lack of parking spaces meaning that permanent-only parking spaces and yellow lines are common ways of controlling vehicle numbers. These are changes that have been made to the inner city. The addition of yellow lines and permit-only parking spaces, that means you have to pay to park. These changes have meant that um, traffic volume has been controlled. Okay, to try and improve unemployment, it's been a lot of industries have been encouraged to locate in these areas. A good example is Sainsbury's Murrayfield, who have built them. They've built on an old area um, where a where a factory used to be. And another example is Cine World. You may have in fact been to this Cine World. This is the Cine World complex here. It's an enormous cinema complex. It's got a bowling alley, all that kind of thing. Um, and you can see in this photo. The reason I've chosen this photo is because just over the road is this brownfield site. A brownfield site is a just area where a factory used to be. And you can see there's two of them right next to each other and another one to the north. These areas used to be factories and those factories have since been destroyed because the industry in the area has collapsed. The, 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 what the council tries to do is to encourage new business to build on these brownfield sites. And Cine World is an excellent example of that. This area here used to be a huge brewing district making beer and is now a, a cinema and entertainment complex. So this is to try and improve unemployment. The, we need to make investment in the area and an example of that is Cine World, which was built on a brownfield site. Okay, um, finally we're into uh, the developments in the rural urban fringe. Here you need to refer to a developed city, that's going to be Edinburgh and you need to give reasons for the recent changes which have taken place in the suburbs. Okay, so let's get started. This is an extract from the Scotsman newspaper. Um, it's a little old, 2007, but it's still very relevant. Uh, read the extract for yourself. I'm not going to read that for you. Um, but the basic point is, is that as Edinburgh expands and grows, it swallows up neighbouring villages. Pennycook is a really good example of one of these villages and Pennycook used to be a market town. That means it had its own shops, it had its own little farmers market, its own butchers, its own fishmongers, all that kind of thing. But now nobody goes to, nobody buys a house in Pennycook to take advantage of the local market. Instead people go to, Penny, to live in Pennycook 
basically just to sleep there. And that's known as a dormitory settlement. The problem here is that Pennycook used to be a village with its own character and culture. And now, as Edinburgh has increasingly swallowed up Pennycook, it's completely changing its character to a place where people just go after they've finished work in Edinburgh city centre. So the character of Pennycook is changing as Edinburgh swallows it up. That is a way to score that mark, a simpler way to score that mark. Um, there's actually three marks on the screen right now, and it is imp I would advise you spend some time looking and thinking about this slide at this point, because these are really clever ways to score the marks. It's quite hard to score marks in changes in the suburbs, so here's three good ways of doing that. Uh, this picture here shows an area of land that was bought by a company called Bellway and Miller. They're a house building company, and they bought West Edge Farm for 300 uh, for 325 new houses. This is greenbelt land. That means it's protected green land on the edge of the city, and uh, it's really popular with house with people who want a house because it's green and open and clean and it's got nice air. Um, building houses on areas of land like this is a problem though. We don't have endless amounts of land like this and every time we build on it we reduce the amount of ecosystem and habitat for animals. Speaking of construction on Greenbelt land, this is straight in Retail Park. As you can see it's absolutely huge. Um, it takes advantage of the lower land values that we find in the suburbs. However, it also destroys habitat. The city bypass was built to reduce congestion in the CBD. That's the first mark. However, when we built IKEA, the shop on the just next to the bypass, this caused loads of localized congestion because of so many people wanting to go to IKEA. This picture out of interest actually shows an improvement that's going to be built on the bypass um, at the Sheriff Hall roundabout, where there's going to be a flyover built. Um, the disruption and damage caused to the environment by construction on greenbelt land like this is really quite significant. Um, finally, this is um, RBS Gogerburn. That's Royal Bank of Scotland Gogerburn. This is an excellent example of a change that's taken place on our greenbelt land in Edinburgh. This is basically a vanity project um, built by um, Sir Fred Goodwin, um, or just Fred Goodwin nowadays um, and it was located in the green lovely beautiful um, green space outside of Edinburgh. It was built here for um, two reasons mainly. One because it had easy access to the nearby airport and two because of cheaper land values. Okay now I'll, um, you need to go back through this video making sure that you write down each of the key notes that you see on the screen. Um, having gone through them, you need then to listen to me talk about it again, because this unit is a complex one. For each of the areas, the favelas in, in Rio de Janeiro, the CBD and the inner city and the suburbs of Edinburgh, you'll hear me make reference to real case studies, which you need to listen to and note down and remember. For top quality answers, you need top quality detail, and the detail needs to be relevant and real. Um, so listen to this video again, pause the video each time the pictures come up, and note down the key marks. Um, if you want to make your life a little easier, what you can do is note down your six favorite marks from each section, uh, and that would minimize the total amount that you're having to learn. Okay. Thanks everyone, I hope that was helpful.